Good evening. My name is Erin McLaughlin, and I'm Vice Dean of Undergraduate Affairs and Professor of German and Jewish Studies in Arts and Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm very pleased today to welcome you, welcome you to the opening reception of the Lest We Forget exhibition, which features the poignant photographs of Luigi Toscano. I'm particularly honored to greet those of us in our audience who are survivors of the Holocaust, many of whose faces we see in the exhibition. We are fortunate to have you in attendance today and would like to thank you for allowing us to honor your experience. Please stand or wave when I call your name. Sigmund Adler. Marie Cutler. <laughs> Oscar Jacob. <laughs> Esther Clearman. Sandy Clearman. <laughs> Yeva Levchinsky. <laughs> Ram Levy. <laughs> Wally Meyer. Rachel Miller. <laughs> Gerhard Silberstein. <laughs> Lot Silberstein. <laughs> George Spooner. Zilla Pula. <laughs> and Felicia Wirtz. <laughs> Please forgive me if I've missed someone whose name is not on my list. In addition to welcoming the St. Louis Holocaust survivors who are able to be here at the opening of Lest We Forget, I would like to mention the names of survivors who wanted to, to attend today's event but are unable to do so. so. Liesel Aschenbrand, Fred and Ava Aschner, Saif Benach, Gittel Burns, Marie Corey, George and Rita Heyman, Liz Meyer, and Miriam Raskin. Further, I would like to remember the survivor Marianne Goldstein, whom we lost last week and whose photo is included in the exhibit. Please join me in a moment of silence in her honor. Thank you. We at Washington University and at the Kemper Art Museum are very proud to host the Lest We Forget exhibition, which has been made possible by the support of Elliot and Dee Dee Simon, founders of Conversation Builds Character. <laughs> Washington University is in fact a fitting place 
to serve as the home of Toscana's photographs for the next two weeks, as we have a long and distinguished history of serving as an intellectual haven for refugees from Nazi Germany and for survivors of the Holocaust. Indeed, at least two dozen Washington University faculty members have been refugees and survivors, including alongside notable faculty in arts and sciences and medicine, the artist Max Beckmann, whose paintings and drawings hang today in the Kemper Art Museum and in the St. Louis Art Museum. And more than a few refugees and survivors became students of Washington University in the wartime and post-war periods, completing both undergraduate and graduate degrees. We are fortunate that these eminent scholars and gifted students brought their intellectual talents to Washington University and played a considerable role in making it the outstanding institution that it is today. At the same time, however, the significance of the Holocaust and its legacy is not just a part of Washington University's past. For a number of our current faculty and students are children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Moreover, Washington University is known for having a number of experts on the history and representation of the Holocaust on its faculty, and in recent years, it has hosted several international conferences in Holocaust studies and other related events. Furthermore, since 1989, we've held the annual Holocaust Memorial Lecture, which aims not only to commemorate the Holocaust, but also to address its broader implications for other instances of systematic persecution, mass murder, and genocide. This year's lecture will be held on November 3rd and will feature Jeffrey Weidlinger, Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. What's more, Washington University also offers a year-long program for first-year undergraduates on the history, memory, and representation of the Holocaust that culminates in a study trip to Germany and Poland. Many of the students in this year's program are in the audience today. Washington University is thus deeply invested in the memory of the Holocaust, and we are proud to bring an exhibition of this focus and caliber to our campus community and to the St. Louis community at large. By featuring the stunning photographs in Toscano's Lest We Forget exhibition on our beautiful campus, we at Washington University aim to fulfill two objectives. First, we seek to honor the complex and multifaceted experience of Holocaust survivors, both during the years of National Socialism and the Holocaust and afterward, as they worked to rebuild their lives in communities far from their original homes. Second, we also aim to commemorate the millions of Jewish people and members of other marginalized groups who were murdered by Nazi Germany and its allies. The latter task makes the former one, that of recognizing the survivors who are in the room, especially poignant because we are aware of the genocidal context of the Holocaust, which makes their stories of survival so exceptional. This context was hit home for me when I was looking at Toscano's eloquent and hauntingly beautiful portraits as they were being installed. In the faces of his subjects, all of whom are survivors of the Holocaust, I see so many things. First, I see the sorrow and weariness that comes with the intimate, even bodily knowledge and experience of the extreme cruelty and hatred to which human beings can descend. Second, I see in the faces of the survivors a steeliness and resilience that indicates the effort and determination they have had to muster in order to reconstruct their lives after the Holocaust. And third, I see the ambivalent feelings of joy and sadness that come with the knowledge that they themselves have reached an advanced age when so many of their friends and family did not have the opportunity to grow old. The images show all this and so much more. 
But in addition to drawing attention to the complex experience of survival of the Holocaust, Toscana's exhibition of survivor portraits asks us, asks us to conjure up a second set of images that can exist only virtually in our minds. These are images that we are encouraged to produce through our own acts of imaginative empathy. They are the millions of unseen or, or, or no longer existent photographs of parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, indeed entire families, all of whom perished in the Holocaust. And beyond that, we imagine pictures of whole neighborhoods and entire communities. In short, the fullness of European Jewish life as it existed before the Holocaust. These multitudinous virtual images float invisibly in the air around the concrete photographs of the survivors as ambient reminders of the cataclysmic destruction of an entire culture and the great loss of millions of individual human lives. They provide the backdrop against which we must view the exceptional experiences and achievements of the survivors we see in the portraits. Such individual images, which function as haunting reminders of those who were killed during the Holocaust, are an integral part of our experience of lest we forget. For me personally, the dimensions of what we see and what we don't see make the exhibition of Toscana's photographs so resonant and impactful. And I invite you, as you tour the exhibition yourselves, to contemplate how it engages and challenges you in deeply meaningful ways. I'm now pleased to present our next speaker, Andrew D. Martin, Chancellor of Washington University in St. Louis. Chancellor Martin was appointed the university's 15th chancellor in 2018. From 2014 to 2018, he served as dean of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts at the University of Michigan. Prior to that, he served in various positions at Washington University in St. Louis, including as the Charles Nagel Chair of Constitutional Law and Political Science at the School of Law, Vice Dean of the School of Law, Founding Director of the Center for Empirical Research in the Law, and Chair of the Department of Political Science in Arts and Sciences. Chancellor Martin earned his PhD in Political Science from Washington University in 1998 and his AB from the College of William and Mary in Mathematics and Government in 1994. Since taking on his current post, Chancellor Martin has worked in particular to expand access to higher education for talented first-generation and low-income students, particularly through the university's unprecedented $1 billion investment in financial aid for students and its recent adoption of a need-blind admissions policy, which means the university will not consider an applicant's financial situation when making admissions decisions while still meeting 100% of demonstrated financial need for admitted undergraduates. Further, Chancellor Martin has made it a university priority to address issues of racial equity on Washington University's campus and throughout the St. Louis region. We are very proud today to have Chancellor with us as we mark the opening of the Lest We Forget exhibition. Please join me in wa warmly welcoming Chancellor Andrew D. Martin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean McLaughlin, and thank you all uh, for being with us this evening. Um, I am really honored uh, to help mark the opening of this moving and meaningful work by celebrated artist Luigi Toscano. I'd like to thank two, director and chief curator of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, Sabine Ekman, for organizing this event, along with Dean McLaughlin. And I know that there were many others who lent their talents so we could gather together today. Thank you. This ex exhibition was made possible by the vision and generosity of Dee Dee Simon, 
chair of the Missouri Holocaust Education and Awareness Commission, and co-founder of Conversation Builds Character. We're so pleased to have been chosen as the home for Lest We Forget in St. Louis. To Dee Dee and her husband Elliot, thank you for your commitment to educating St. Louisans about the past so we can work together toward a better future. And <laughs> And thank you especially to the Holocaust survivors we have in attendance today. Your very presence serves as a rebuke to those who might deny, trivialize, or distort the atrocities committed by Nazi Germany and its allies against millions of Jews and other marginalized groups during the Holocaust and World War II. We are so pleased to welcome you to Washington University. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, St. Louis became home to one of the largest Jewish populations in the Midwest. Some in our WashU community may have Holocaust survivors in their families, but for others, this exhibit provides a unique opportunity to engage with this important chapter in our collective history. These arresting portraits are meant to serve as a reminder of dark days from the past, but also to provoke new dialogue around the alarming rise of hate in our society today. Anti-Semitic incidents hit a record high in 2021, according to the Anti-Defamation League, and in online forums and political movements worldwide, we see that dangerous stereotypes and falsehoods about Jews persist, as do diverse forms of xenophobic nationalism. But hatred and bigotry can only thrive in the vacuum of ignorance. And ignorance can only be countered by confronting, reckoning, and learning from the past. Today's political climate all but encourages us to other those with different backgrounds or beliefs. The Holocaust shows us frightening, the frightening territory where that path can lead. So we must remember and we must reflect. I hope that we all take a moment to stop and ponder these larger-than-life images, that we take hope from the strength and resilience they depict in their subjects' faces. The scope of the Nazi persecution of Jews can be horrifically abstract. Let us consider the faces of these survivors as a window into our shared humanity. Like the struggle for human rights, this exhibition is part of a larger archive that continues to evolve producing more than 400 portraits of survivors since 2014. 12 new photographs of St. Louis Holocaust survivors now join them. This exhibition has been displayed in the United Nations, in New York, and in Geneva, in Washington, D.C., Berlin, Brussels, Vienna, and Kyiv. We are so proud to display it here on the campus of Washington University in St. Louis, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to share this time with you. Now it is my privilege to invite Dee Dee Simon to share some thoughts with you about the exhibit and the important edu educational work that she's doing here in St. Louis. Dee Dee, welcome. Thank you, Chancellor Martin, and welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to see you all here tonight. We've been blessed with such a beautiful evening to gather to celebrate all Holocaust survivors, but especially those here with us tonight and those who are joining us via live stream at home. Have you ever had an experience that spoke to you so deeply that no matter how much time passed, you just could not let it go? When my husband and I first saw Luigi Toscano's Lest We Forget in 2018, when it was displayed around the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool in Washington, DC, we could not let go of what we had taken in and what we needed to do. We have seen some very powerful Holocaust sites from around the world, but none spoke to us quite like this one. Bringing Luigi Toscano's Lest We Forget here to St. Louis has been in our hearts since we first encountered it. The eyes of Luigi's subjects 
have a powerful effect on the imagination of the spectator. Although a still image, the eyes speak quite loudly as if they are daring the passerby to journey within to learn a little bit about the survivor's personal stories. Stories of pain, suffering, and stories of hope. But does the passerby dare stop, look back, and accept the invitation? Or does the passerby continue on their way as if he or she never saw the photo at all? The Holocaust is indeed a difficult subject to approach. And allowing ourselves to learn the unpleasant truths about this history takes courage and comes with responsibility. The Holocaust happened because ordinary people, just like you and me, allowed it to happen by making decisions to either perpetuate or ignore the cruelly, cruel and deadly events that led to this atrocity. What began as hateful words escalated into discrimination, dehumanization, and finally, genocide. The phrase, never again, that emerged from the survivors after the Holocaust has sadly not yet become a reality. Genocides, crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, mass killings are still happening in our world today. Here in the United States, all we have to do is turn on our televisions or look to our cell phones to see that hate and anti-Semitism are prevalent. There is no shortage of hateful words or actions toward those who are deemed different than another, be it because of one's race, religion, sexual orientation, disability, gender, or gender identity. As long as one population of people are deemed lesser than, we are all at risk. Because of this unfortunate reality, we wish to extend our gratitude to Scott Biondo, Director of Community Security at the St. Louis Jewish Federation, and all organizations that are working hard to ensure we have a safe exhibition. We extend a special thank you to Special Agent Jay Greenberg and the St. Louis FBI for being a great partner in the fight against anti-Semitism and hate. Thank you to all who are working to create a safe space around an exhibition that must be seen to ensure we never forget. LH and I, on behalf of Conversation Builds Character, brought this exhibition to St. Louis because we wanted to celebrate those who survived and we wanted to remember those who perish. We want to teach by bringing awareness of this history to those who may or may not know about this cataclysmic event. And we want to build unity and community by putting this exhibition in public spaces, Luigi Toscano attempts to get into the consciousness of those who see it. We hope that this exhibition will be a catalyst for the difficult conversations that need to happen in order to break down barriers and build peace and unity in our communities. We would like to thank our community leaders, elected officials, and legislators who are present here this evening. We hope that you will utilize your platforms to begin a conversation for change where needed in your circles of influence. We would like to extend a warm welcome to the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, Mr. Wolfgang Mussinger, and his wife, Marie, who are joining us from Chicago. And to Honorary Consul, Mr. Paul Obernufemann, um, and Lisa from O'Fallon, Illinois. I thought my maiden name of Wingermilly was a mouthful, so <laughs> I tried my best. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this evening. To all Holocaust survivors, near and far, we want you to know that we see you and we hear you. For those survivors who have shared their unique stories so they may be carried forward for future generations, we thank you. Words, fa words fail us in our ability to truly comprehend all you endured. For those survivors who are not able or who do not wish to share your stories, we are grateful for your presence. 
Sometimes it's the unspoken words that speak the loudest. By partnering with other forward-thinking organizations, Conversation Builds Character will continue our work to raise awareness of this history and create dialogue for change. Thank you to our friend Jill Shoup, who has advised us since Conversation Builds Character was just an idea. And a big thank you to the Kemper Art Museum and Washington University for partnering with us to make this event a reality. And to WashU Hillel, the Center for Humanities and Arts and Sciences, and the Missouri Holocaust Education and Awareness Commission for your support in tonight's opening program. Thank you. It is only apropos that this exhibition, which has been in the works since January 4th, 2020, is happening at this time. In July of this year, legislation was signed into law mandating Holocaust education in the state of Missouri. By the 2026-27 school year, all students in grades 7 through 12 will have an opportunity to learn about the Holocaust. On November 2nd, the new Kaplan-Feldman Holocaust Museum will once again open its doors to the public. This museum that uses the history of the Holocaust to reject hatred, promote understanding, and inspire change will be a resource not only for teachers and students, but for all citizens in the state of Missouri and throughout the Midwest. We would like to thank Helen Turner, Director of Education and Interpretation, and the museum for your support in making it possible for Holocaust survivors to be present and witness this evening's event. Thank you. And yes, I did stalk Luigi Toscano on the internet so I could inquire about bringing his exhibition all the way from Mannheim, Germany to St. Louis, Missouri. I can only imagine what was going through his mind. Who is this lady from St. Louis? <laughs> Luigi would later share with me that it is usually a government that sponsors his work, not private citizens. We exchanged several emails during the following months, and eventually Luigi suggested we hold a Zoom meeting. Ultimately, Luigi decided to take a leap of faith, and here we are tonight. Thank you, Luigi, for trusting in Elliot and myself. Thank you. One of the things that we appreciate about what Luigi does is that wherever he takes this exhibition, he photographs survivors from the area who will be forever included in Lest We Forget. In May of this year, he visited St. Louis and photographed 12 Holocaust survivors whose portraits are now on display outside in Tisch Park. It was an absolute honor to accompany Luigi on these visits, along with Marcy Rosenberg, a guardian of Holocaust survivors. Marcy, who chronicles survivor stories so that they can be passed on in perpetuity, also made it possible for these 12 survivors to be a part of Lest We Forget. Marcy's help in this effort was invaluable, and we will be forever grateful to her. Thank you, Marcy. What some of you might find surprising is that Luigi Toscano is a self-taught photographer and filmmaker. As a roofer, a bouncer, and a window cleaner, this son of Italian guest workers who's gained experiences from many different perspectives. It was only in his late 20s that Luigi discovered his passion for photography, a passion that was born out of the necessity to record and share his ideas. Luigi Toscano's work focuses on people and reveals what lies behind what we see with our eyes. He presents his large-scale portraits in central locations that are accessible to everyone, such as parks, squares, and house fronts. This way, the portraits gain an uninhibited entry point into the everyday lives and consciousness of the people passing by, independent of origin, age, or education. In 2014, Luigi's first exhibition, 
which was brought to life after a brief encounter with a refugee on the street, opened in the central square in his hometown. It was also in that same year that Luigi began work on Lest We Forget, his multimedia memorial project focused on Holocaust survivors from all over the world. This exhibition first opened in 2015 and is now compl complemented by a picture book, a documentary film, and an app. To date, Luigi has visited and photographed almost 500 Holocaust survivors from around the world, and his work has been seen by some 2 million visitors from Europe and the United States. For this artistic remembrance project, Luigi Toscano was designated as a UNESCO Artist of Peace, the first German and the first photographer worldwide to receive this honor. Soon thereafter, he was awarded the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, the highest tribute that can be paid to individuals for services to their nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the podium, all the way from Germany, our friend and now yours, Luigi Toscano. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear excellencies, dear Holocaust survivors. Yeah, um, I'm now nervous and I forgot everything what I would like to say, but I hope you can forgive me. First of all, I would like to say thank you to you, Didi and Elliot, that you helped me to bring this exhibition here to America again, to St. Louis. And also, I would like to say thank you to the survivors, that it was a really, it was an amazing experience with you in May. Also, you, Marcy, that you helped me. Yeah. Um, You know, the most question what the people ask me is why I do that, you know? Why you do that, you do all the sacrifice, all this work, all this, you know? Um, you know what, what is what my answer? My answer is um, I would like to stand up against anti-Semitism, racism, and any kind of hatred, you know? And I remember that one, when I met the first survivor, he said to me, Luigi, if you forget the past, we are dumbed to repeat it, you know? And you know what's going on right now in the world, you know? For especially in Europe, in Italy, in Germany, you know? And I, I would like to be an upstander, not a bystander, you know? And that is my motivation for do that, you know? And I can tell you a, a, a really small story, and I would like to, <laughs> yeah, to that you participate, and hopefully you can understand me. My English is not so good. I have the big honor to be in here in university, uh, at my second university, I, the first university. I, I show my exhibition in Pittsburgh, and now it is the second. And uh, when I was young, I have not the possibility to go in the on the university. You know, my, my parents were poor and we have not the possibility. So now <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, um, I showed this exhibition also in, in Berlin and um, and I remember on this day, I don't know when we set up the exhibition together with my team, I put two guys, one guy there and one guy there. The name of the one guy is Walter, Walter Frankenstein. He comes from um, Stockholm in Sweden. And the other guy, Horst Sommerfeld, is, um, he comes from Berlin, you know. And I don't know on this day, I put these two guys together and you know, Walter, who lives in, in, in Stockholm, in Sweden, he read only one German newspaper, you know? And on the opening, 
They came a photographer, a journalist from this newspaper and took a picture from these two guys, Walter and Horst, you know. And uh, the day after, Walter calls me from, from Stockholm and said, Luigi, Luigi, what you done, what you done? And I say, sir, I don't know what you mean, you know. And he said, this is Horst, this is Horst, my old school friend. And after 80 years, they came together. And you know what is the tragic on the story? Horst Sommerfeld family was completely killed and Walter's family completely survived, you know? And yeah, and um, I can tell you also other stories, but I will not uh, uh, disturb you with, with, with the stories. And, and I would like to say thank you Thank you for your support, and thank you for everything. Thank you. I'm a survivor from Stutthof concentration camp. There are still some people that say it never existed. It's a made-up story. Hate. I believe is the worst disease in society which causes all the problems. It starts with hate and ends with Holocaust. Toscano has been trying to address for the past three years when he set out to capture and share the stories of Holocaust survivors. His work is now on display at a public art installation. On and today you can see a unique traveling exhibit outside the World War I Museum in Kansas City. We've told you about it. There it is. It's called Lest We Forget. You can look at 75 years ago. It's important history to most of us, but... job of all these pictures. I think it's contributing a great deal to the awareness of the Holocaust in San Francisco. It tells the story and then now people can put a face on that story, see actually the people to whom it happened.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rachel Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm still here. <laughs> I am one of many. I wish that I was not speaking here today as a Holocaust survivor. My story is only of one but of the many survivors here today that I represent. Each and every one has a unique story. We survived. Our family members did not. I hope you will take the time to learn about every survivor here with us today. My story is not a happy one. It took me a very long time for me to be able to speak, and now it has been 27 years, and it's still painful. When I first arrived in New York in 1946, people were still mourning for those they lost in the war. No one wanted to talk or hear about what happened, the memories were so horrific for Americans and immigrants. We all wanted to put it behind us and move forward with our lives. In 1987, while living in California, I joined the Child Survivor Group and went to many conferences. I attended workshops with social workers who helped us learn to speak about what we lived through. It wasn't until I gave testimony to Steven Spielberg Shore Foundation that I found the strength to speak. It was around 1993 when my husband Milton and I moved to St. Louis to be with our son Neil, his wife Marcy, and granddaughters Jenna and Julia that I started speaking at the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. It is not easy to speak about your entire family being murdered, and it still hurts and frightens me and makes me very emotional at times. There are three reasons why I continue to speak. The first is that it keeps my family alive. I had a wonderful childhood and loved my parents, aunts, uncles, cousin, my two brothers, and my sister, Sabine, and me. I was the baby of the family, and I think they tried to protect me from everything that was happening. My father family had lived in Warsaw, Poland, until they moved in 1932 to Paris, France, to be with my father's sister and brother and my mother's two brothers, thinking that it would be safe there. I was born in 1993, 30, pardon me, 1933. <laughs> and remember many times until my father and uncle were taken away on August 20th, 1941. They were taken to the Drancy internment camp outside of Paris. They both mysteriously died on December 30th, 1941 in two separate hospitals. I've learned that they had been used for medical experimentation and in injected with Zyklon B gas that killed them both. 
After my father died, everything changed. Everyone's is so sad. I was so happy to be sent to the summer farm with my friend. I did find it strange that my mother told me not to tell anyone that I was Jewish, and she gave me a new name. My new name was Christine. When I was told that my family was taken away, I did not want to believe how could my ent entire family be gone. I was in the country when my aunt sent me a letter saying that when it was safe, she would come and get me and bring me back to Paris. In the interim, Anita came out. Anyone having a Jewish child, if they'll report them to the police, they will get 300 francs. The farmer sent a letter to my aunt asking her if she should report them to the police. My aunt sent her the 300 francs, and as a result, I am here today. My aunt said, uh, pardon me, my aunt uh, took, took me to my house when we walked past. They were looting the, the house. I insisted on going upstairs. Instead of grabbing my favorite doll, I grabbed my family pictures. They are now my most precious possessions. I spent the next several years back and forth from pensions, <coughs> convents, orphanages, and my aunt's house. I kept changing my identity. When I was with my aunt, I wore a yellow star that said Juif, Jew. When I was hiding, I was Christine, I never made a mistake. When the war was over, I found my way to the United States, and it was all very frightening and lonely. The second reason I speak is because of the guilt that I felt for having survived. I thought my mother did not love me, as she had sent me away with my girlfriend to the summer farm outside of Paris. I was nine years old and was told that my sister Sabine, my wonderful sister Sabine, would join me the next week. I left on July 13, 1942. She never came. During the night of July 16, 1942, the Jews in Paris were arrested by the French police and the Nazis. and they were sent to a place called Val d'Hiver. From there, they were sent to a concentration camp named Auschwitz. It was then that I had to give up any hope of finding them, especially my beloved sister Sabine. Eventually, I came to the realization that my mother sent me away. She did love me very much and saved my life. The third reason I speak is because I want people to know the actual story of what happened. It is, a very, it is very important for students and adults to hear an eyewitness account, to see the pictures of my loved one that were murdered. When I speak, it brings me back to the vivid memories that have haunted me my whole life. The picture you see on the screen is of my family. My father, Nuta, my mother, Haja, my older brother, Adolphe, my brother, Henri, and my wonderful sister, Sabine, and me. It is never easy. I never want anyone to feel sorry for me. I want them to listen and learn from my testimony and never forget. I keep speaking because I do see that I am making a difference by the letters that I receive from so many of the students and adults who have listened to me. I have drawers full of letters 
telling me that they will always remember me and my story. As the years gone by, I've tried my best to survive and tell my story. I have survived breast cancer and other illnesses. Once again, tragedy struck when we lost our son Mark to AIDS in 1992. My husband, Milton, died in 1997. It is horrible what one human do, being can do to another. I can only tell my story of loss and hope that people listen and learn what can happen when people learn to hate. It is my hope that we will continue to tell these stories and I will continue to speak as long as I live. We need to teach what can happen when the loss of humanity which causes anti-Semitism, bigotry, propaganda, bullying, lies, and hate. I would like the world to be at peace, for people to respect one another, and it starts with respecting oneself first. Everyone has the right to be in this world, with no exception. Why do I keep speaking? because every time I get a hug from a student and they thank me, I know they've heard me and connected. I've kept my family of life. I've blessed my survival gifts. I have taught my history, and hopefully I have made a difference. I would like to thank Dee Dee and Elliot Simon, Washington University, Marcy Rosenberg, the Mildred Lane Art Museum, and all of who have made tonight's event possible. I would especially thank Luigi Toscano for this incredible exhibit of hundreds of Holocaust survivors around the world. There can be no mistake, the Holocaust did happen, and we are still here to let everyone know the truth. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. I am honored to have the privilege to give closing remarks tonight. I would first like to ask you all to please wait for a moment after I finish speaking to allow the survivors time to exit first, and then we will all head over to Kemper together. I would also like to give a content warning for further discussion of genocide and death. My name is Miriam Silberman. In true tradition, I am named after my great-grandmother on my father's side. I am grateful to be before you today, not just as a speaker this evening, but alive, and in the United States as a grandchild of survivors. Lest We Forget speaks to the experience of Holocaust survivors, not just as a thank you to those with us, or as a remark of gratitude for their survival, 
but as a reminder to the gift of life and the different journeys we all take to survive another day. My grandparents were of bar mitzvah age, about 13, when Belgium was entrapped in Nazi attacks, unable to escape until sever several days after the siege began. They did not know each other then, but they escaped the same small town and met years later in Oklahoma City as two of the few Jews living there. They bonded over their experience as Jews in a Christian city, but like many survivors, reliving the attacks was traumatic and a subject often left unspoken. Tonight, we speak. Every person in this room is asked to confront not just the Holocaust itself, but how it affected and still affects real people. We are also asked to remember survivor identities and move beyond what happened to them and into who they became after their experiences. The Holocaust was a life-changing, earth-shattering event, not just for the survivors here today, nor just for my grandparents, but for my family and for their families and for all those in the world who wish to uphold and preserve the wonder that is life. And yet, despite the calamity and its impact on our lives, it is not where life begins and ends. I would like to share with you a piece of my family's history and some of the life my grandparents lived. After fleeing Antwerp and everything they knew, the Silbermans, my grandfather's family, were outsiders in Oklahoma. Growing up, I was told stories of school assignments, including the New Testament of a form, as a form of intentional discrimination and what life was like when a nuclear family was all you could depend on. Later in life, a flourishing community cropped up around them, but before that, my grandfather's family became friends with the indigenous Kiowa tribe, taking specific interest in their history of land and culture loss, oppression, and the art that was created as a result. Art takes many forms, music, paintings, textiles, words, all existing to tell stories difficult to speak and leaving documentation for those in the future. While most of the Silverman legacy, property, and art was lost to Nazi demolition and theft, my family found importance in preserving art from an oppressed group whose losses mirrored their own, a collection that supports indigenous artisans and helps others from forgetting what the original Americans experienced after and during colonization. Today's medium takes the form of larger-than-life photography of people with us today. In seeing it, we are encouraged to remember tragedy but we are also encouraged to remember life and how history is a documentation of life and that life is not just a means to create history. My grandmother is not remembered to me as a piece of history. She was an avid painter, a jeweler, a homemaker, a mother and a wife, a daughter, a sister, a grandmother, and one of the strongest, most resilient women you could ever meet. And although she has passed, she is not the past. Too often do we relegate those we love to a distant memory, and worse, we allow ourselves to forget those around us um, as unique individuals with stories still being written. As you look at the faces at the exhibit today, remind yourself that these are not stationary pieces of history, but people who walk among you. Remind yourself that there are layers to remembrance, including learning from history. Lest we forget those around us are just like us, we are doomed to allow the past to repeat itself. Thank you again for coming out tonight. We will be exiting shortly to look at the exhibit. Please wait for survivors to exit first. I look forward to seeing you all at Kemper.